Hi everyone, welcome to Better Reporting, Covidence and Prisoner q and I'm Laura from the Covidence community team and I'd like to welcome Julie, Matthew and Annalise, our panellists. Dr Julie Brown is a community manager with Covidence based in New Zealand. Julie has 17 years experience preparing and writing systematic reviews in academic and commercial fields and has been an author representative on Cochrane Council. Dr Matthew Page is a Senior Research Fellow and Deputy Head of the Methods in Evidence Synthesis Unit in the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine at Monash University. His research aims to identify and address correctable weaknesses in the design, conduct and reporting of systematic reviews of health research. He co-led the development of the PRISMA 2020 Statement for Systematic Reviews and was a member of the core group who developed version two of the Cochrane Risk of Bias Assessment Tool for randomised trials. Dr Annalise Arno is a product manager with Covidence and a project manager for Living Guidelines at the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine at Monash University. Her PhD, completed in 2022 at University College London, focused on the use of automation for health evidence synthesis. Annalise is based in Melbourne, Australia. Welcome to you all. So the Covidence community team gets a lot of questions from you, our users, about Prisma. Over the next hour, we're going to answer some of those questions and we'll also provide some background information and a demo of the new Prisma features in Covidence. Please ask any questions using the uh, questions box, which you should be able to see to the right hand side of your screen. And we've got Razia and Gida from the Covidence community team online answering those today. Everyone who's registered for this webinar will receive the recording of it by email in the next 24 hours. The slide deck that we're going to use today and a link to the recording will also be made available on the Covidence knowledge base in the next 24 hours. To view the slide deck, go to support.covidence.org and search Prisma Slides. A handout from today's session will be posted in the chat. And if you're watching the recording, a link to this handout will be included at the end of the slide deck. Okay, I think that, uh, that concludes the housekeeping. I'll hand over now to you, Julie. Great, thanks very much, Laura. Um, so I'm just going to, here we go. So basically, systematic reviews and meta-analyses have become increasingly important over time. And clinicians and academics read them to keep up to date with their field. And they're often used as a starting point for developing clinical practice guidelines in healthcare. In academia, granting agencies may require a systematic review to justify, um, to ensure that there's justification for further research and that's independent of academic field. And as with all research, the value of a systematic review, it really depends on what was done, what was found, and the clarity of reporting. So I've put together here a few of the challenges um, that I've identified, and a lot of these have come through with um, those of you that submitted some questions and um, when you registered. So thank you very much for your contributions there. So these are the challenges when we're trying to report the flow of studies through a literature review, regardless of the type of review. So whatever the type of review you're working on, it's important that there is a transparent way of reporting sources of references. And that can be really quite difficult sometimes. Identifying records and studies from other methods and information sources, such as citation searching, websites, um, and grey literature, for example, is one of the trickiest components of a systematic review to report. So the ability or lack of ability really to track the initial number of records that have been identified is often determined by the process used to identify and screen the records. And as well as that, the system used to manage the records identified from other information sources. So basically when records are all centrally tracked, regardless of the source, it's easier to produce this data. Other challenges to reporting include decisions about what are acceptable sources of databases and where to list um, things like grey literature and conference proceedings. 
We find that reasons for exclusion are also a common challenge to reporting the findings of literature reviews. Some researchers want to report um, reasons for exclusion at all stages of the review process. And other challenges occur when there are multiple um, reasons for exclusion. And we're going to be hearing some discussion around those challenges um, in a moment um, when we're talking to Matt. Just finding a way to collate all of the information centrally and to get it into an accurate flow diagram is, is the real challenge. And many of the available systematic review management tools that are currently available can't do that for you and don't reflect the changes that have been seen in Prisma 2020. So hopefully by the end of this webinar, we'll be able to help find some solutions for some of these challenges that are going to make writing a systematic review much easier for you. So a little bit of history um, and about PRISMA itself. So the reporting quality of systematic reviews is very variable and that limits the reader's ability to assess the strengths and weaknesses of those reviews. So if we look at some um, research that took place in the late 1980s, if they found that there was really poor reporting of scientific criteria in the reviews that were published in the leading medical journals then. And that led to the development of the quorum statement. So that's the quality of reporting of meta-analyses um, that came out in 1999. In 2009, the guidance was updated and was renamed PRISMA. So that's preferred reporting items or systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And more recently, that's been subsequently updated again, really to incorporate advances in systematic review methodology and terminology. And that's what we now refer to as the 2020 PRISMA statements. So the PRISMA statement itself is 27 item checklist um, that provides a comprehensive summary of all of the methodology and processes associated with your review. And that's what allows the transparency and replication. So PRISMA is there as a guidance to help you as authors to improve the reporting of systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And it's also used um, by journal editors and peer reviewers to evaluate systematic reviews that have been submitted for publication. And in some journals, that's a requirement, although it isn't actually a quality assessment instrument. Along with the checklist itself, and um, there is an explanation and elaboration document um, with these fantastic exemplars. And they're very, very useful in helping you to think about how you might want to write up that information. As well as the exemplars, there are a number of extensions with PRISMA as well. So these have been added to the main statement to help with reporting of specific types of reviews or specific populations. You can see um, the link here to the PRISMA site that you can access at and have a look. So the um, particular item on the PRISMA statement that we're interested in um, in our current discussion is item 16A. So this item asks you to describe the results of the search and selection process from the number of records identified in the search to the number of studies included in the review, ideally using a flow diagram. So the description of the flow of studies is going to be the same, regardless of the type of review that you're doing. Um, and there are some recommended numbers that should be reported that are listed on this slide. So the information retrieved should tell us about the number of records that have been identified and retained at each stage of the review process as you go through your study and your review. Records that are excluded before screening can include um, duplicates, for example, or studies that have been deemed ineligible by machine classifiers. The review team should also try to identify studies that could not be retrieved 
And these are kind of studies that they might be unavailable to the team, or there might be cost um, restrictions in accessing it. But that information should be there. Um, and that's the, the main point of being transparent. If applicable, um, you can also include the number of ongoing studies identified. And if possible, again, um, identify how many records were excluded by a human and how many by automation tools. So this is the Prisma flow diagram um, at its simplest and its most complex. The grey boxes um, tend to only be, need to only be completed if applicable, otherwise they can be removed from the flow diagram. They refer to previous studies on this side. So that's if you're doing an updated review. This is the main um, flow of studies if you're using databases and registers. And you can also add a section about studies that have been identified through other methods. So there are currently four templates available that can be used, um, that can be accessed from the Prisma website. And they depend on the type of review, so whether it's new or updated, and the sources used to identify the studies. So that's databases and registers alone, or databases and registries, plus other methods. So that's just a very brief overview of some of the challenges that we have and a little bit of information about Prisma. Now, we put together some of the questions that were submitted when you registered um, and collated those. And we're just going to put forward um, these questions now to Matthew Page. So, Matthew, if you're ready. Yep, I'm here. Great, fantastic. So, firstly, we had a number of questions submitted asking about if it's okay to edit the Prisma template. So either by changing the wording or by adding and removing boxes. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. I um, the way we see the way the reason we published Prisma 2020 as an in an open access journal is because we wanted to allow people to use the the checklists and the flow diagrams. Um, without having to contact us for permission, but also to, if they wish, modify it in a way that is more, most suitable for their review. Um, as long as they acknowledge that it's based on the Prisma 2020 template, then that's fine by us. I mean, I think when we were putting together the new template, we were reflecting on the challenges we experienced when using the original flow diagram, but also we noted that many people edited the original 2009 flow diagram in the way that best suited their needs. Um, and so we recognize that um, it's not always going to be possible to make a template that fits all scenarios. And so by all means, if, if you've considered a way that uh, demonstrates the flow of articles in your review um, more succinctly or um, in more clearly, then uh, there's no, there's no problem whatsoever with you doing that. It'd be nice if you if, if you had some template that you use that you want to share with me and the Prisma team, then we're very happy to see that and consider that for, um, I know when we were developing Prisma, we initially had this idea of continually updating a bank of worked examples um, that we could uh, highlight to the community. Um, and so we're very open to people submitting to us their flow diagrams and explaining to us what we've done wrong with our template and how we can make it better. Fantastic. Thank you for that. So the next set of questions that came up were basically around the definitions that we see in the Prisma flow diagram, where we have both reports and records. Um, and this seems to be quite confusing for some people. So can you just tell us the difference between what is a report and what is a record? Yep. So we in the original flow diagram we made the distinction between um titles and abstracts and full text reports this time around we thought it made more sense to use a more generic term like records to 
capture things like titles and abstracts because we recognize that not every review author is necessarily just going to be screening titles and abstracts identified in bibliographic databases. Sometimes they're screening uh, trial registration records that appear within clinicaltrials.gov. And so, um, or, or they're accessing um, individual participant data sets um, that, are, uh, that have been uploaded to say the open science framework. And so uh, we wanted to use a more encompassing term uh, like records to capture that sort of first basic summary information um, about a study. Um, on the other hand, a report is the more in-depth explanation of the, of the study procedures. So it could be a journal article, it could be a full clinical trial registration record, it could be a clinical study report that was submitted to um, uh, regulators by a pharmaceutical company. And so again, we didn't want to just use the limiting term like publication in that sense, because we know that review authors um, tend, not to just, well, tend not to just use standard journal articles in their systematic reviews. Um, so that's uh, a distinction we tried to make. I will note though that um, I have had a number of people contact me pointing out that the, with really only one letter differing between those two words, it can be a bit hard to miss that there's actually a distinction. And so we might, um, I mean, we're open to ideas for other um, terms if people want to submit them and we can consider that. Thanks. And there's just one more question that came up there about if the, if the number of reports and records are the same, then do we report them separately and repeat the number or do we just report them once? Um, I mean, I think that it's helpful to report them both because this, this is again a frequent question that I've had about what is the distinction between studies and reports of included studies. And the reason that we introduced that distinction was because um, I know, I mean, I've done, I've authored probably 20 or 30 systematic reviews and in every single one of them there was at least one study that was reported in mo multiple journal articles. Um, so you might have had a trial conducted um, by Brown 2018 which reported the results at three months follow-up and then they have another article on the same study that presents the results at 12 months follow-up. And so I often found that without making that distinction, it can be sometimes difficult to know when you're following the numbers down through the flow diagram. Often you'll, I'll, you'll see published systematic reviews for which it becomes clear that there's a, um, there are studies with multiple reports, but they're not accounted for in the flow diagram because you end up, say, with an indication that, say, 50 full text articles were screened and um, let's say that 40, no, let me say 40 were, um, ex 40 reports were excluded, but then they ended up with eight included studies. What they're failing to point out is that of those eight included studies, a couple have two reports attached to them. Um, so I think that if, even if you, if you don't, you only have one report per study, I still think it's helpful to specify that just so that it removes any ambiguity and, and lets people know that in this instance you're dealing with a system in your systematic review you only have access to a single report about each study when really in fact most studies have multiple reports available to them whether they're a conference abstract or a, a full report sent to the funder or to the regulators versus a journal article as well so um, and we're always encouraging people to get as much information about a study as they can Thanks very much. I think that's that's very um, useful advice um, for us to take on board. Um, so we had quite a few questions come in about title and abstract screening. So the first um, question we've got here is, um, does title screening and abstract screening need to be done separately? Um, this is really up to the authors, I think. There's no standard um, 
at least to my knowledge, I've never really come across any conduct guidance for systematic review that uh, suggests that the, this stage should be separated. I do know though that some authors find it easier to screen titles first just because they find it quick to really get rid of completely irrelevant articles in that using that method. But there's no expectation that people do it that way. I myself have never followed that method. I've always read the title along with its abstract. If, if say, I'm just screening um, uh, records exported from a, a bibliographic database. So um, I, it, there's, yeah, as I said, it's really up to whatever's the most easiest method for the authors. Um, right. In the flow diagram, we don't separate it out. So if you do uh, create, if you do follow us a, a, a method where, uh, sorry, follow a process where you screen titles first and then abstracts, you would, you might need to modify the flow diagram to account for that. Absolutely, thank you. The second question there is, um, again, was asked by quite a few people about do the reasons um, for title and abstract exclusion, do we need to state a reason that we've excluded them at that particular stage? Um, in so in Prisma 2020 um, and, this, and, this, and and in the previous version, and it was not recommended that people record reasons for exclusion of every title and abstract they screened. I think doing so would likely slow down the process of doing a systematic review unnecessarily. Um, I uh, in some cases there are some reviews I've worked on where authors have found it helpful to record a reason for exclusion of, of the titles and abstracts. Um, these were more complex reviews um, and the, the, that was just up to the authors themselves. They felt that they wanted to be able to backtrack and, and um, being able to have a record of that. But I think the vast majority of review authors don't really do that. Um, like I said, I myself don't do it. And most systematic review software that enables you to screen really doesn't even allow you to capture that information. I know Covidence for one does not allow you to record a reason for exclusion. So if you wanted to do that, you would have to make, uh, re record those reasons outside of the software, uh, which again is a bit, um, funky and not, not ideal, but yeah, we don't recommend it. And that's why there's no text box and the flow diagram asking for reasons for exclusion at the title and abstract level. Perfect, thank you. I think that'll answer quite a few people's questions there. So the next um, set of questions we had are really about um, exclusion here. So this was one of the challenges um, that we thought were there about the flow of um, studies and recording data. So we have a question about how many exclusion criteria can we display in the flow diagram? Is there a limit? Um, it, well, in terms of a limit, the limit really comes down to how small the text your flow diagram uh, you are willing to allow it to become because we don't have any hard and fast rules saying that you should only include four reasons or 10 reasons. Um, I've seen some reviews that provide extremely long reasons for exclusion in the, in, the, in the box in the flow diagram, which means that their reason for exclusion box expands almost half the page of the diagram. As long as it's legible, then that's completely fine. And if you wanted to include 20 reasons for exclusion, as long as it makes the, the, the diagram is still legible to readers, then that's completely fine. Um, so there really is no restriction. Uh, the, the answer, I, I'll, I take that back. The restriction essentially comes down to legibility of the, 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 the diagram. Yeah, wonderful. And then um, this question is about how should I handle studies where there are multiple reasons for exclusion, but I can only choose one of them to go into the, the flow diagram? Yep. Um, so in this instance, what I think is helpful is to, um, before you even started screening your, your, your reports for eligibility, I think it's useful to come up with a hierarchy of reasons 
Um, so uh, you might say the most, uh, you might put at the top of the list that this is an ineligible, this, this, the, the report you're reading has an Ill, ineligible study design. So it's clearly not a randomized trial, for example. And um, the next analyst might be that it's ineligible participants and then ineligible um, uh, interventions and, and going down that list. Clearly, there'll be some reports for which maybe all five to 10 eligibility criteria you have actually apply, but there's no need to record for those reports um, that all of those criteria um, were not met. You could simply just stop at the first one. Um, and, and, and essentially that's what the way covidence is structured, covidence is structured too, in that you really are only allowed to select one reason. Um, and that's why only one reason uh, will then ultimately appear within the box. So we know that when it comes to counting the number of reasons for exclusion, um, it's not a true reflection of all the possible reasons. It's really just documenting um, what was the most important reason for exclusion across those studies. Um, so I would not even bother attempting to record multiple reasons. Um, I think it just saves time to just go with the most obvious reason first um, and then work your way down the list. Great advice, thank you. Um, the next set of questions um, I think are quite interesting. So they're around other sources of evidence and especially grey literature. So when you find a conference proceeding, through database searching, should you record that under the database section or under the other sources, under grey literature? Um, I think that if a conference proceeding appears within your search of a database like Medline, um, and I know that there are several instances where um, journals will publish conference proceedings in a particular issue, and so the abstract appears within Medline, then I think if that's the way you've located it, then it should be listed in the flow diagram um, underneath uh, uh, as, as, as a record that was identify, identified by a database searching, um, because that's how you identified it. I wouldn't try and move those ones across into the other sources category, because that other sources section of the flow diagram really should just be for um, study reports and records that are identified through methods other than database or trial register searching. So I would keep it in the database searching column. Perfect. Um, and I think some people are, are just trying to find out if there's going to be any more specific guidance from Prisma about including um, grey literature within um, systematic reviews and reporting um, it. Not to my yeah, not to my knowledge, but I think uh, I'm intrigued that uh, that has that was a question that's come through. So that indicates that there's some demand for such information. Um, so I think that's helpful to feed back to the Prisma Executive Group um, to consider whether um, whether such guidance needs to be developed. There's no one I'm aware of who's um, producing such guidance, um, but uh, yes, if for anyone if anyone's on the call who uh, made that suggestion, it would be good if you could get in contact to explain ex specifically what you think is missing from the the current guidance um, and, and what specific advice you, you, you would like on that front. Fantastic. So I've got a, quite a few questions here and I think they can kind of be condensed really. These are all about um, questions about extensions. So I just wonder um, if you can kind of give us a little bit of information about um, if particular extensions are going to be updated, if there are any new ones on the horizon, for example. Yep. Um, yeah, so uh, this is a good question. So essentially, um, there are, there's definitely a team who are um, interested in um, embarking on an update of the, uh, the Prisma extension for scoping reviews. They're just currently uh, seeking funding for that. Um, uh, there's essentially this issue that some of the extensions are, are keen to be updated um, so that they're more consistent with Prisma 2020. 
um, because that sort of follows on to the second question. I, I've seen that question a couple of times on, on social media, people saying, well, uh, do we, if we're doing a scoping review, should we use Prisma for scoping reviews or should we now move to Prisma 2020? Um, I know the developers wrote a commentary piece, I think in JBI evidence synthesis uh, journal where they kind of provide some inter interim advice on essentially using both Prisma for scoping reviews and Prisma 2020 concurrently when using a scoping review, doing a scoping review, I should say. But um, like I said, there is um, some work going on uh, to help um, update Prisma for scoping reviews. Um, similarly, the, the the extension that was uh, um, uh, embarked on to create an extension for rapid reviews, um, it's not been finalized, but that's, uh, that's also part of a work package to help uh, finish that and, and update some of these extensions so that they're consistent with Prisma 2020. Um, so watch this space for that one as well. Um, I'm not aware of anyone uh, embarking on an extension for reporting mixed methods reviews. I, I did note um, in the last few, couple of months on the Equator Network Library, which is basically the main source for you to find out what extensions are um, being developed currently. Um, uh, the, I think Jane Noyes and, and collaborators um, registered a plan to create a Prisma extension for qualitative um, evidence syntheses. Um, whether they're also doing mixed methods reviews, I'm not sure, but um, uh, that's something that um, uh, if, if someone's interested in doing that, then they should reach out to us at Prisma, the, the Prisma exec to um, run that by us uh, um, and see if, um, if that needs to be done. Great, we've just got time for the very last question. Um, and that's, um, are there any lessons that have been learned in the time since publication of the Prisma 2020 statement that really stand out for you? Um, I think the main lesson is, I, I guess the need for this webinar itself is a reflection of the fact that more often than not, the questions, the main, the main questions I've received about Prisma have had to do with the flow diagram. Um, so I'm going to assume that that means that there's no problems whatsoever with the checklist items um, and everyone's happy with them. Um, uh, but uh, I know that a lot of people um, have uh, had some uncertainties about the flow diagram. So that's always good to get that feedback and figure out how we can improve upon that. Often when I'm, I mean, I'm just happy to just reply and give my answers to people and they, uh, um, I, they uh, always um, just say, great, that's all clear now. Um, and so that's, um, I haven't necessarily had people come back and say, well, you should change it. Um, uh, but maybe that's because everyone's very polite. Um, but <laughs> yeah, that's I think the biggest lesson that um, uh, I've learned, but it's been nice to get uh, um, some, uh, nice to know that people are interested in still using these reporting guidelines. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for all that information, Matt. I really appreciate um, your insight and the time um, taken today. Um, no worries. Wonderful. Whoops. So the next we're going to, um, I'm going to hand over to uh, um, Annalise, who's going to tell us a little bit about the new Prisma features in Confidence itself. Uh, but why I'm here today is not to learn so much as it is to demonstrate. Uh, so Covidence has recently added a number of features relating to source tracking as well as to the Prisma diagram, which we hope you will find quite useful. Uh, today, we are going to learn about how to add database information to your Covidence Prisma, how to add information about other sources, besides databases and registers to your Covenants Prisma, how to download your Covenants Prisma, and how to report deduplication details, as well as a number of other items uh, which are new to Prisma 2020 and new to the version of the Prisma flow diagram that is exported from Covenants. So I'll hopefully give you some handy tips about how to best put that diagram that Covenants provides for you to good use. So we're going to switch over now to the tool itself. 
hopefully this page is a fairly familiar view for you all. So we're now on my review summary page where I can keep track of my screening at title abstract, at full text review, and of course my extraction as well. So the first thing we're going to have a look at is a new feature relating to importing uh, your citations into your review. So if I go to import a file, just like I have done many times before, you'll see a new dropdown that's on this page. So let's say I'm importing a bunch of studies that were completed as part of a previous uh, version of this review. So I might wanna put them straight into my included list. I can then select a source to associate with the studies that I'm about to import. There's a list of default sources here. So everything you're unfortunately not seeing um, because of GoToWebinar's limitations, uh, but there's a default list of sources in a drop down there. And if that list doesn't have what you need, you can click Manage Sources here, which will bring up this pop up. So this is what was showing in that drop down. Um, but if I need an additional source, uh, or database, I can add it here. So a couple things I wanna draw your attention to on this list. Um, first off, you'll see Central, CNAL, probably lots of these are pretty familiar for everyone. There is citation searching added as one of the default sources though. The reason we did that was to make sure it's very clear that this feature is not only to be used for database tracking, you can use it for registers, you can use it for uh, websites for organizations, for gray literature, and of course for citation searching. So since my example was about uh, studies that were in a previous version of this review, I might even add a custom source called previous update. I'm going to add that and I now have a custom source in this list. The next thing you'll notice is that there's a little trash can or bin icon next to the source previous update. So I can delete that source from this list, but I can't delete the default sources. So I then select whichever uh, database I want. In this case, the one that I've just added is previous update. I would select the file and then go ahead and import that. So the next thing you're going to want to have a look at is after this is imported, a couple of changes have been made to the import history page. So this is going to redirect me to my review summary page. Then if I go to import references and view details, I can see the studies that I've just added. and the source that I added to them, in this case, previous update. So let's say I made an error here. You can see that the title of the file name was actually Medline. So maybe I wanna change this and say Medline. So I click source, again, go into this drop down, and change that to Medline. And of course, make sure you click save. The big thing to know from this page uh, you might have noticed that I could only add a single source while I was importing from a file. However, from import history, I can add multiple sources. So let's say I happen to have put everything into a reference manager before I actually brought it across to Covenants, in which case I'm gonna have lots of references from lots of different databases and other sources. So I would click add additional source, select what I want my other source to be. I can add as many as I want, et cetera. I'll just add two for this demo. And the key thing here is that the reference count total has to match the file itself. So lots of sort of safeguards were put into place to make sure that the data that's eventually going to display on your PRISM diagram is in fact valid. It's not going to let you save counts that are wrong, um, and it's going to always double check that for you.
Um, a couple other changes to import history that I want to highlight before we look at the PRISMA diagram itself. Um, these boxes used to be very slightly different. Uh, they used to show things like error counts and so on. Um, we actually found that an error hadn't occurred in about five years. So we thought, you know what? It might be more useful to display more explicit information about things that have been merged as a study, which does happen more often. And Matt talked about earlier about how sometimes you have multiple reports that all relate to the same trial or study. And in Covidence, you're going to want to merge those so that they become one item moving through your review. So we now call out the number of references which have been merged into a single study. And you can also go straight to your duplicates page, which I'm going to show you in a second as well, because there's some information there that I'm actually going to need to update my Prisma. The last two things I want to call out on this page are that, uh, as I alluded to earlier, the file name displays here. That didn't used to be the case. Uh, for myself, I find this incredibly, incredibly useful. So first of all, I can put information in that file name that I know I'm going to need later. Things like, when did I do this search? Which database did it come from? Really anything, um, just to help myself keep track of that information. Um, so I find myself often coming into a review and going, oh shoot, have I actually imported this file before? I don't want to end up with a bunch of duplicates falsely. Um, and if I look at the file name, I now avoid that problem. And the last thing on this page is that that manage sources option is available here, just like it was during importing from file. So if I click manage sources, I get that same pop-up. I'm actually going to undo this import to make sure that uh, the Prisma we're going to look at in a second, in fact, matches the information here. So the page that I wanted to highlight for you is the duplicates page. So if I had clicked on duplicates either from import history or from my review summary page, I get this split count of how many I marked during the process of screening versus how many were system detected. That's the wrong tab, sorry. Okay, so now we're back at the review summary page and I'm going to click on Prisma. So what I see here is similar to what we've seen previously in Covidence. So the original Covidence Prisma diagram was based on the 2009 version. The version that's in the tool itself is still, broadly speaking, based on the 2009 version. But I see my sources have now been counted and reported here, and it does call out for me, hey, you've got a few here that uh, weren't specified, so maybe you want to update those. So that's going to lead me to my import history page. And from there, I scroll down until I see the one that has a blank source, which is this one. And in this case, I'm actually going to create a custom source for this called Websites. And I'll save that information against that import. And now all of my studies um, have assigned sources and my Prisma will be relatively complete, at least in terms of what's in Covidence. So I no longer have this prompt of, hey, you forgot some sources, maybe you should update that. And I'm ready to go. Um, if you're super familiar with this page, this upper right corner has changed a little bit. It used to say export data right here as plain text. That has been changed to the view as text button. So I click on that and I get a pop-up that has just a plain text version of the information in my Prisma if I want to copy it and put it elsewhere. But the big one that we're here to look at today is downloading as a Word document. So I'm going to click download and that will give me a file which I can then open 
and have a play with. So I'm going to switch windows now to Word. It was really important for us that this went into a Word document because we wanted people to be able to edit it. Um, a lot of tools will give you an image or will give you a PDF. Um, and while PDFs are technically editable, it's a lot trickier than a Word diagram, of course. Um, so this is very much given to our users with the intention that you do make changes that you need to make for your reviews, Prisma. So this would be the diagram as it was just put out by Covidence. And there's a couple of changes that I know I want to make. So first up, in the first row, I have this uh, two different boxes about what's been imported. I have my databases and my registers, and I have other sources. So this is sort of like the central part of the Prisma 2020 diagram, except it does add in the other sources box. And we did that because we found it was the most common element um, apart from that central part that people used in their diagrams. So websites, isn't really a database. So I'm going to take that out of this box and put it into this other one. And I didn't have anything that was citation searching or gray literature, so I'm going to overwrite those and then just update my numbers. So now my first row is all set. The next thing I want to update uh, is sort of my second row, which has to do with duplicate removal. So remember, we had a look at the duplicates page in Covidence, and so I could identify which ones were identified manually. So I'm going to update that number to six, and which ones were system detected or detected by Covidence. The default template is also going to include these lines out of the Prisma 2020 template, because we want to really flag for everyone, if this is relevant to your review, you should be reporting it. So if you've used any automation tools, if you've used a machine learning classifier or really anything else that removes uh, duplicate records or just any records prior to the screenings process, you should report that here. Not relevant to my review, so I've deleted it. My third row is really all set. This is my title abstract screening and uh, records or studies in this case that were removed during title abstract screening. The next row is studies sought for retrieval. Um, we went back and forth on what to do with this because obviously this isn't a data point that Covenants actually collects, but we decided to keep this in and make the assumption that anything which has moved through full text review was sought for retrieval. So that's the default. But what I have done and what I recommend for all of you to do is use a full text exclusion reason to track that information and then to update these numbers manually. So I know because of this that I had 21 full texts that were not retrieved. So I'll take it out of that box, update this number, update this number two. And put that 21 up into these studies that were not retrieved. And with that, this Prisma is actually ready to go. Um, so the final row in this case has my studies which were included in the review. And I know a couple of questions came through about ongoing studies and awaiting classification. If you have used those tags, this box will also be populated with those numbers. So I'll switch back to the slides now and sort of sum up what we've learned. So some tips about adding sources. Use your file names to track information like the search date, the database or other source, update number, or really any piece of information you want to track. You can add a single source when importing a file or multiple sources from import history. And you can use the default sources uh, provided by Covidence on every review, or you can add a custom source using managed sources. And some tips about the diagram itself. After you download your Word document, move other sources, citation searching, gray literature, websites, anything like that, out of the top left box and into the top right box. 
update details about your deduplication, use of automation, or any other pre-screening reference removal, and use an exclusion reason in Covidence to track the studies that were sought for retrieval that were not retrieved. And that is everything from me. Thank you all. And I'm going to hand over to Laura now, I believe. Thanks, Annalise. That's great. Um, really useful run through there. Um, I'm aware we've just got a few minutes left on the call today. Um, there's been some questions coming in via the chat and via the questions box to, uh, to you, Gida and, and Razia. Is there anything uh, that's come up there that you'd like to share with the group or that you've seen that, that we could answer usefully in the remaining few minutes we've got on the call today? Yeah, thank you, Laura. So, um, Rosie and I mostly uh, responded and they, there was a few questions uh, related to uh, the Prisma. Just one that came through about really a question about Google Scholar, whether is it uh, considered a, a, a database or um, what, like which, where should they report the Google Scholar uh, information either under database or citation searching or gray literature? Um, so that was a question also that came in. Uh, um, Matt, do you want to take that one? Or, um, yeah, so I was answering a lot of those questions. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's possible to track that. I was basically typing through all of Annalise's demo. Oh, great. Sorry, thank Annalise. You. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, but yeah, it's a tricky, that's a, that's a tricky one. Um, I generally typically consider Google Scholar as something that should go on the other sources part of the diagram, mainly because um, unlike you typical databases like Medline and Embase and even clinical trials of Gov, it's not really that easy to get those records into Covidence um, from Google Scholar. Um, so I tend to just, whenever I'm really searching Google Scholar, it's one of those things that I tend to just do it manually at the website itself and sort of, I know there's guidance to stop at a certain number of pages, like 20 pages, I think Neil Hathaway recommends. Um, so I sort of put it as the other sources um, column, but I I I I I don't I mean if I think if people wanted to classify that as a database, there's no problem with that as long as it's sort of marked it that way and specify that they're counting it that way. Um, thank you, Matthew. Um, so there's this another question which is unanswered. So is there a specific guidelines for a rapid review? No, uh, not yet. Um, there's uh, uh, people are developing some guidance about what to report for rapid reviews. I know that for now, I personally don't see that there's much that needs to be different than I think if, if I think many authors have been using just Prisma 2020 to guide their reporting of a rapid review, because again, Prisma is about reporting guidance, not conduct. So it's not telling you what methods to use in a rapid review. It's telling you how to report your methods. And so if um, if you use some expedited methods, such as only one author screened articles and things like that, then you can just use Prisma 2020. But there is a team working on thinking in, in more detail than I have thought about it and thinking through all the issues when it comes to rapid reviews. Um, so that's being developed. Yeah. So, but then can the extension for scoping reviews be used for rapid reviews? Could be similar to that, maybe. Uh, I would only do, I mean, I think uh, if you're doing a rapid scoping review, then yes, I would consider using Prisma scoping reviews um, to guide your reporting of your rapid scoping review. Thank you. Uh, there was just one question as well about at which stage can I insert citation references? Um, can I add them at full text stage or, uh, yeah, at the full text stage? I think that was a question probably and at least when you were probably demonstrating um, so if there's any citation searching uh, coming from is there any requirement where they need to be in confidence when, when imported I, I probably yeah, citation uh, chasing or tracking uh, mm, um, sorry was that for me or for Matt yes you, you, you analyze yeah. Yeah. Um, you can import references to any any stage of your review in Covidence. 
um, what's going to happen if you were to import them straight into full text review is that Covenants is going to treat all of those references as if you have already completed title abstract screening elsewhere. Um, so if you have if you have a group of 10 studies that you import to full text review, the numbers in full text review in your Prisma diagram are going to update, but the numbers in your title abstract are also going to update. Thank you so much, Andy. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, but Thanks, yeah. Bye. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, did you want to add something, Matthew? <laughs> so there was this interesting question that uh, there are so many quality criteria tools. Um, is there a criteria to use the best quality tool? So basically, uh, even for one study design, we find different quality uh, tools. But um, is there anything uh, you would like to shed light on regarding how to use that, how to choose that tool? Um, yeah, no, I answered that as well. Um, and I basically pointed out that no, <laughs> unfortunately, we don't have like a good sort of system outlined as to what to choose, which tool or risk bias tool or quality assessment tool to select if multiple are available. I know that there are a team in the UK who were trying to get funding to essentially come up with a library of, or, or a website similar to the Equator Network website, which would be a, basically a website of quality assessment or risk of bias tools for which they could indicate sort of the pros and cons um, of each of those tools. But I don't know if that work has progressed. So uh, unfortunately, no, I often just have people email me and I tend to just tell them which is the tool that I'm, that's my favorite. And I think that's what everyone does. They, seem, they end up just recommending their, their pet's tool, but there should be a better process put in place. I agree in terms of helping decide between them, but there isn't as yet. Great. Okay, thank, thanks, Matt. Thanks, everybody. Um, we're at time. So um, I just really like to say on behalf of the community team, a huge thank you to our panelists today, uh, also to the product and engineering team at Covidence and to everybody who's attended or, or listening to the recording of this session today. So you'll each receive a follow up survey and we'd really love to get your feedback on that so that we can plan more webinars that align with your interests. Thanks again, everyone, and happy reporting. <laughs>